We're going to talk here about uh, neonatal jaundice. This is absolutely critical for the test. You're going to be asked a few questions about this, surely. Uh, and of course, if you work in pediatrics or family practice, uh, this is something you need to be very acutely aware of. This is something that happens a lot. And you need to uh, be aware of what normal neonatal jaundice is or the physiologic jaundice uh, versus something uh, more pathologic. So we're going to talk about bilirubin metabolism to refresh that. It's going to help us sort of uh, get the idea of what the pathophysiology is uh, so uh, some of these diseases make sense. We'll talk about physiologic jaundice. You definitely need to know the difference between the physiologic jaundice, which is the majority of jaundices uh, in the uh, in the uh, newborn nursery, uh, and then pathologic jaundice, which has a specific cause that needs to be treated. Uh, and then uh, we'll also talk about indirect versus direct hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, this is just like in adults, you can have indirect hyperbilirubinemia or direct hyperbilirubinemia. The difference is in the neonates, uh, you've got different causes, different, uh, different diseases that can cause these. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about some causes of pathologic jaundice. And we'll, we'll talk about these in greater detail in uh, subsequent uh, lectures. So this is the bilirubin, uh, I guess you can call it the bilirubin cycle. Uh, some of the bilirubin is uh, reabsorbed by the gut, so it does kind of make a cycle. But uh, ultimately, bilirubin stems from the red blood cells, just like in everybody else. Uh, red blood cells... When they get old, they uh, are uh, destroyed by macrophages in the spleen. Uh, they break down into the heme and the globin portions, uh, and uh, then the heme ultimately gives rise to bilirubin. So let's look at this in some greater detail. So the first step is the red blood cell is broken down in the spleen, uh, and the hemoglobin is going to be broken down into the globin protein, which is recycled, and then the, uh, the, the heme portion. And that heme uh, is, has iron, and then it's got a, a porphyrin. So uh, the heme is then uh, separated, uh, the iron is taken off, and uh, the heme then becomes biliverdin, and the enzyme that, uh, that facilitates that process is called heme oxygenase, and that iron then can be, uh, can be recycled. Biliverdin then gets converted to bilirubin, uh, and that's uh, by the enzyme biliverdin reductase. The next step then is bilirubin gets taken up into the circulation and it is subsequently bound to albumin. Now some bilirubin will be free, but uh, the majority of bilirubin, the vast majority of bilirubin will be bound to albumin because bilirubin itself is not water soluble, so it needs to be bound to a protein in the blood. And we'll see when we talk about pathologic jaundice, as some of the uh, 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 pathologic jaundices, if there's not enough albumin in the blood, then you're going to have a lot more circulating free bilirubin, and that's going to come into play uh, when we talk about uh, bilirubin encephalopathy and cernicterus. So the bilirubin is transported to the liver, bound to albumin. The albumin dissociates from the bilirubin, and then the bilirubin enters the hepatocyte. And then the important step here, uh, when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about direct versus indirect. Uh, bilirubin is that the bilirubin is conjugated, uh, has some uh, sugar moieties that are added onto it, uh, and that's uh, by this enzyme UDP glutamyl transferase, or it's also called UGT1A1. And this conjugates the bilirubin, uh, so instead of just regular old bilirubin, you have conjugated bilirubin. The conjugated bilirubin is more water soluble. And so this is what's going to go into the, uh, into the biliary tract and ultimately into the intestines. So the conjugated bilirubin is transported out the hepatocyte into the biliary canaliculi by a protein called multidrug resistant protein 2. Uh, I wrote it here as MDR2, but it's usually they abbreviate it as MRP2. So it's multidrug resistant protein 2. Uh, and this is what transfers con conjugated bilirubin into the biliary tract. And then from there, it goes into the uh, intestine at the duodenum and uh, ultimately gets deconjugated at the terminal ileum.
some bilirubin will return to the liver, and that's the hepatoportal uh, circulation. The bilirubin that does not return to the liver uh, will get converted by bacterial enzymes into stercobilin, which is passed out in the feces, or urobilin, uh, also urobilinogen, uh, which is what it is initially. Uh, and then that, uh, the urobilinogen goes into the bloodstream and then ultimately is excreted to the kidneys as urobilin. And that's what gives uh, urine its yellow color. So th these are your pigments for the feces and uh, the urine. So here's your process. We went through all of this. So physiologic jaundice, you need to know what this is. This is absolutely critical because you will be given a question on the USMLE and uh, it may be physiologic jaundice, but they want to try to sideline you and make you think you need to treat it. Virtually all babies will have some degree of physiologic jaundice. Uh, you may not notice it because it might be really, 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 uh, might be really slight, uh, but most babies will have uh, an elevation of bilirubin uh, that may be noticeable as jaundice. And this occurs as the baby transitions from reliance on the placenta to clear bilirubin onto the baby's own hepatic system. And the physiologic jaundice occurs because the baby's system is not quite ready to deal with the bilirubin yet. And there's a few things that happen. First off, some of the fetal hemoglobin, it's not quite as stable. That's going to uh, break down a lot faster uh, when the baby uh, transitions into neonatal life. Uh, and then also the, uh, that enzyme, the UDPGT, that is not quite uh, in sufficient amounts necessarily yet uh, at the very first day of life. Uh, second day of life, and so uh, that also can uh, can lead to uh, a higher bilirubin. And then also the uh, the uh, the intestines are not moving quite as fast as they will uh, in in uh, by the end of the week or week two, and so that's going to slow things down and increase the enterohepatic uh, reuptake of the uh, bilirubin. So there's lots of different factors that lead to a baby's uh, uh, should say diminished ability to clear bilirubin, but that's normal, and those things go away with time. Uh, so physiologic jaundice, uh, first off, important to know, is never visible on the first day of life. If you ever see jaundice in a baby in the first 24 hours after birth, it is probably a hemolytic process. Uh, secondly, the total serum bilirubin may rise up to 5 milligrams per deciliter per day up until day 3 to 5. Usually it's not that much, but it can rise up until that much up until day 3 to 5. So while the baby's in the hospital, you should take a bilirubin after birth, day 1, day 2, so you can plot it out and see where the baby is falling. The conjugated bilirubin will never pass 2 milligrams per deciliter or 20% of the total serum bilirubin, whichever is lower. So let's say that the baby has a uh, let's let's say that the baby has a total serum bilirubin of of four. Then uh, the cutoff for conjugated bilirubin is going to be 0 0.8 because that's 20% of four. So anything above 0 0.8 is going to be pathologic because the conjugated bilirubin is more than 20% of the total serum bilirubin. Beyond, if the total serum bilirubin is beyond 5, then uh, 2 milligrams per deciliter is the cutoff for conjugated bilirubin, uh, where it becomes pathologic. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. 2 milligrams per deciliter is not always the, uh, the, the sharp cutoff for uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. 20% uh, of the total serum bilirubin. If the total serum bilirubin is below 5, uh, th that can be the cutoff as well. Uh, the total serum bilirubin will peak around day 3 to 5. Problem is, babies typically not in the hospital around then. 
And then visible jaundice, if it's present, uh, will resolve by one week of age in a full-term baby and typically by two weeks of age in a premature infant, premature infant being defined as less than 37 weeks of gestation. And that the reason it takes longer in the premature infant is for all of those reasons I described. That the baby's uh, liver and GI tract still need, needs a few more days to come to maturity uh, even after the baby is born. So here's what neonatal jaundice looks like. You can see kind of a, a gold tinge to the baby. And not all neonatal jaundices look alike. It might be really obvious. It might just be really slight. Just depends. See, this baby, a little less noticeable than the first one. Good place to look is the eyes. So here you know it's scleral icterus. That's always jaundice. And particularly when you're dealing with uh, darker skinned babies, uh, the eyes are going to be a good place to look. So pathologic jaundice is any jaundice that doesn't satisfy the criteria for physiologic jaundice. So this is visible jaundice on the first day of life. It is a total serum bilirubin that rises faster than 5 milligrams per deciliter over a 24-hour period. Uh, it is a conjugated bilirubin that surpasses 2 milligrams per deciliter or 20% of the total serum bilirubin, whichever is lower. So again, giving an example, if a baby has a total serum bilirubin of 3.8 and a conjugated bilirubin of more than 0 0.76, that would be considered pathologic because that's more than 20%. But like I said, if, it, if the total serum bilirubin is beyond 5, then we just use a cutoff uh, of 2 milligrams per deciliter. We don't take 20% for that. And then if the total serum bilirubin continues to rise after day 5, that's also considered pathologic. So if any of these criteria are satisfied, it's considered a pathologic jaundice. Now, one of the most important things that you're going to be responsible for knowing uh, on uh, as far as uh, as far as jaundice goes, is determining whether it is a direct or indirect hyperbilirubinemia, and then from there, particularly for the indirect hyperbilirubinemias, coming up with a diagnosis. So when you're talking about the direct hyperbilirubinemia, you really have to go on the history, on uh, any additional symptoms that might be present. Was the baby possibly exposed to uh, to infection? Uh, does the baby have any signs of genetic or metabolic diseases? Uh, those sorts of things. Um, does the baby appear well or ill? Uh, so that's going to be a little bit more difficult uh, to ascertain the cause, especially on just your basic step two and step three questions. When it comes to indirect hyperbilirubinemia, uh, it's a little bit easier. So with an indirect hyperbilirubinemia, there are two things you really need to get and that's a direct Coombs test and a reticulocyte count. And you can probably even add on to that a hematocrit. Uh, that's going to tell you uh, two things. It's going to tell you whether or not there is hemolysis going on, and it's going to tell you uh, if there is hemolysis, whether or not that hemolysis is autoimmune, so an isoimmunization like uh, RH isoimmunization or an ABO incompatibility, or if it is a non uh, autoimmune uh, hemolysis, and that would be things uh, like uh, like uh, a uh, oh um, a uh, spherocytosis or a liptocytosis, uh, some of those things that you see more in uh, adults as well. Uh, typically, uh, these uh, non-autoimmune uh, hemolytic diseases don't present in newborns, but they can. So I'm just including these in here for, uh, for completion's sake. Okay, so here's a few examples uh, to sort of uh, nail down this pathophysiology here. So RH incompatibility, we'll go into this in more detail in the uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia section, section but uh, this is an attack on fetal red blood cells by maternal anti-RH antibodies, typically anti-D antibodies, which is the major uh, antibody uh, that causes problems uh, with RH incompatibility. There's some minor ones, but for the USMLE, be aware of the anti-D. That's usually what they're referring to when they're referring to RH incompatibility. Uh, this happens if the mother is RH negative and has previously carried an RH positive fetus 
and now, uh, and so since then, she's created anti-RH antibodies, and now she's carrying another RH positive fetus, and now those anti-RH antibodies can uh, cross the placenta and attack the uh, the baby's red blood cells. So if mom is RH negative, and it's her first pregnancy with an RH positive fetus, even though there is exposure to blood, she's not going to create the antibodies to attack that fetus. But if she has had a pregnancy with an RH positive fetus and then she has another pregnancy with an RH positive fetus, now the antibodies are there and it can attack that fetus. Now we can prevent this, uh, but uh, this is something to keep in mind because uh, if the mother didn't receive adequate care, uh, then uh, this can come into play. So as far as diagnosing this, uh, we're going to try to stick to the pediatrics here rather than the uh, OBGYN. For the baby, it's going to be that direct Coombs test. The direct the direct Coombs test will come out as positive. Treatment, uh, you can, this, this really, in the United States, you really should be treating this preventatively uh, with good uh, obstetrical care. Uh, you, you should be, uh, and this is part of any, uh, part of any uh, uh, prenatal visit, you should be doing uh, RH titers, anti-RH titers uh, on RH negative mothers so that you know uh, whether or not you need to administer RH immune globulin. And that's going to help you prevent this from happening in future pregnancies. Uh, but from the pediatric side, if you have a baby who uh, was delivered with RH incompatibility, uh, then the treatment is going to be phototherapy and exchange transfusion. Exchange transfusion more so in extreme cases. We'll talk about this in greater detail in uh, the indirect section. ABO incompatibility is pretty similar, uh, but it's not as severe. Uh, it, it's um, it, it's uh, it's it's more it's more common than RH incompatibility, but it's less common to be a problem. So uh, this would be exactly how it sounds. So mom has a different blood type than baby, and she's got antibodies that attack baby's uh, blood cells. So let's say mom is uh, has type O blood, baby has type A blood. Mom has anti-A antibodies, which will cross the placenta and attack baby's red blood cells. This is, it's very rare for this to be severe and uh, so usually uh, when you see severe uh, immune-mediated hemolysis, it's going to be the uh, anti-RH, uh, the RH isoimmunization, but this is another possible way to have an immune-mediated uh, hemolysis. And just like in RH uh, hemolysis, RH isoimmunization, you're going to get a positive direct Coombs test. Uh, so for diagnosis, uh, it'll be positive direct or positive direct Coombs test, uh, you should uh, also note that there will be an ABO incompatibility with mom. So baby certainly shouldn't be type O blood. Baby will be either A or B or AB, and mom will be incompatible with that. Uh, you should rule out RH incompatibility if necessary, but usually this is pretty clear, and it's uh, very rarely as severe. The treatment for this is to monitor the baby, uh, and then UV phototherapy is necessary. Krigler-Najjar syndrome is uh, the absence of that enzyme, that UGT1A1, uh, and that is the enzyme that's responsible for conjugating bilirubin into conjugated bilirubin. And there are various degrees of absence or deficiency of this enzyme. So in Krigler-Najjar syndrome type 1, that's a complete absence of uh, UGT1A1. And so these babies are completely unable to conjugate bilirubin. And so this is going to cause a severe indirect hyperbilirubinemia. And ultimately, this is going to require liver transplant. Uh, type 2 Krigler-Najjar syndrome, these babies are just deficient in this enzyme. So they'll probably develop a, an indirect hyperbilirubinemia, but it won't be as severe. And with time, it will get better. Uh, because you don't need quite as much of this enzyme as you have. So even though they're deficient, it's, it will typically be enough as they get older. 
so this will cause also an indirect hyperbilirubinemia, but you can differentiate type 1 from type 2 because in type 2, you can give the babies phenobarbital. Phenobarbital will induce this enzyme. And so in these babies, when you give them phenobarbital, it should reduce their total serum bilirubin by around 30 to 80%. Uh, of course, if they don't have any of this enzyme, then phenobarbital is not going to do anything because there's no enzyme to stimulate. Usually type 2 Crigler-Najjar syndrome is not diagnosed in, uh, in the neonatal period uh, because this, is so, uh, this, this deficiency is, is uh, so minute uh, that it doesn't really re uh, result in symptoms. Uh, but type 1 is the one you need to be aware of. This is a total deficiency and this always will require transplant. Dubin-Johnson syndrome is a, uh, a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So this is a uh, due to a mutation of that um, MRP2 protein, uh, and that's responsible for transporting the conjugated bilirubin out into the biliary canaliculi. This is an inherited disease. It's autosomal recessive. Again, this is another one that's typically asymptomatic, uh, but when it does present, uh, it's usually during the teenage years. But it can present in babies, so I want to include this because this is all part of our differential here. Uh, what, what I'm trying to nail down here is sort of that, uh, sort of this pathophysiology, so you kind of get an idea of where things can go wrong. Uh, so uh, this uh, can be diagnosed uh, with, in the urine. Uh, it's an elevate, there'll be an elevated ratio of the, uh, the uh, coproporphyrins, and uh, I doubt the USMLE will ask you about this, but uh, that's technically how you would diagnose Dupin Johnson syndrome. And treatment is uh, symptomatic, uh, but usually it is not uh, necessary because this doesn't really cause any severe symptoms. Biliary atresia is a big one. So this is uh, this is very important. This will always present in babies. So this is not going to this is not like Dubin Johnson syndrome where uh, you got a 12 year old presenting with biliary atresia. That doesn't happen uh, with biliary atresia you have a defect of the biliary tract, and so that's going to cause problems early on. And usually it's so severe that you can't even get the bile from the liver into the intestine. And so this is obviously going to be a conjugated bili uh, hyperbilirubinemia because you can conjugate the bilirubin, but then the conjugated bilirubin will not be able to get to the intestine, and so it's going to build up and get absorbed into the bloodstream. Uh, no single test is diagnostic for biliary atresia. Uh, you kind of have to suspect it based on labs, uh, which show you a conjugated bilirubin or conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, kind of excluding other possible causes. Sonography, uh, you'll get a triangular cord sign uh, in, in some cases, a HIDA scan. Uh, but the best way to diagnose this is when you really suspect biliary atresia. You go in for, uh, for an operation because you think you're going to have to do uh, an operation to treat this baby. You do an intraoperative cholangiogram, and that is the best, most accurate way to diagnose biliary atresia. And the, the uh, procedure you're going to do after you do that intraoperative cholangiogram and you diagnose biliary atresia is called a Kasai procedure. Uh, what you're basically just doing here is taking a part of the intestine and sewing it up against the uh, against the porta hepatis, and this should be performed early, within eight weeks of age. If it's performed after that, it really doesn't have good results. If it's performed before that, it has much better results. Uh, so you can see the importance of uh, of diagnosing this ASAP. Uh, again, we're going to go in greater detail into all of these uh, disorders in the subsequent sections. I just wanted to give you sort of an introduction uh, to some of the major causes of uh, neonatal jaundice. Uh, oh, and then one more. Okay, neonatal hepatitis. So this is uh, this is a disease of the uh, of the um, of the uh, liver tissue itself. It's an infection. Uh, it's either congenital or it's acquired early. Uh, these babies will appear ill and they'll feed poorly. So this is going to be another conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, but unlike the biliary atresia, these babies will appear ill. They tend to be lethargic and hypotonic. They'll also have dark urine. 
but the meconium in stool is typically unremarkable. It's not a colic stool like you would see in biliary atresia or the extrahepatic uh, hyperbilirubinemias. For diagnosing neonatal hepatitis, you just need to get a, uh, a, a, uh, an array of uh, titers for specific pathogens, particularly viral pathogens, HSV, enteroviruses, CMV. Uh, viral causes are the most common, uh, but there are also bacterial causes as well, uh, syphilis, E. coli, um, some other ones, group, group B strep. Uh, and then the treatment is going to be based on the specific pathogen, of course, fluids and adequate nutrition, uh, and then uh, supportive care, uh, making sure that you supplement the baby with uh, medium chain triglycerides and vitamins A, D, E, and K. So like I said, we're going to go over all this stuff uh, in subsequent sections. So if you feel like I didn't explain any of this in really good detail, you're right, I didn't. I just want to sort of give you a, an introduction here. So I will see you in the next section.